and welcome to Close Up with The Hollywood Reporter. I'm Rebecca Ford, and I'd like to welcome Kevin Feige, Gabriela Rodriguez, Bill Gerber, Cece Dempsey, Nina Jacobson, and Paul Greengrass. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Thank We're you. We're going to just get right going here. Um, I'd love to start with um, producers wear many hats on set. They take on many roles when making a movie. What is your favorite role to take on and your least favorite? Bill, you're first. <laughs> My favorite role uh, to take on is problem solving, is being faced with a situation and sitting down with a team of people and figuring out the smartest, which we think is the smartest way to, to get through it. Um, the least uh, favorite part of it is telling a filmmaker you can't do something for any number of reasons, whether it be money or time or anything else for that matter. Who else has a favorite and least favorite role? Gabrielle? Um, my favorite, well, I really enjoy prepping and the shoot. I kind of don't like post at all. <laughs> so to me, getting into that rhythm, and actually I'm, I'm a very on-set producer, so I'm, I'm there every day and I enjoy that part the most. Uh, least favorite, post, everything to do with post. I just feel like I just want the movie to be done. I feel like we've done it now, just get on with it. So, but uh, yeah, the shoot, I guess. Um, when we're talking about telling people no, as, as you brought that up, I'm curious if any of you have a story about the biggest d disagreement you've ever had with the director and how, as a producer, you fixed that problem. I have that all the time. <laughs> With yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I fire the writer, that's me. And then I always want to fire the director. And that's that's yeah. me. But uh, You no, probably it's... could tell me um, what makes a great collaboration with a producer. As a director, what are you looking for in, in a great producer? I think the relationship between a director and a producer is absolutely fundamental. I mean, speaking from a director's point of view, the most important thing is that you need to be working with a producer who, in some indefinable sense, but which is always clear, you want to please that person. Mm. And the reason for that is because there has to be someone, when you're making a film, who is the person who tells you what they think and you believe them, because in the end, they're on your side but their role is to tell you the truth. So creatively, logistically, and in every way, they're making the movie with you, but they're standing at your shoulder saying, yeah, we did well today, or mm, I think we've got a problem with this, that, and the other. That, that's the, the fundamental thing. When you have an honest back and forth and you feel like you actually go into the conversation knowing that it's not a given what the outcome of this conversation is. It's not a given that I'm right. And if we could both go into that conversation with both receptivity and conviction and find our way through it together, that's the most pleasing part of the job. And when it's the least pleasing is honestly, I think when you have a filmmaker who doesn't actually want your honest opinion, they just don't actually want it or that they're so sensitive that in order to get to the thing you want to say, it has to be couched in a whole bunch of preamble mm -hmm. instead of just getting down to the work and having that fundamental trust, which is mm -hmm. that you're going to tell me the truth, I'm going to tell you the truth, and we're going to figure out together a solution that's not based on ego, but that's based on our shared love of the thing we're making together. Mm -hmm. So have you had that bad experience where you're sort of tiptoeing around uh, them. Of course. <laughs> yes. Not on, you know, not on the movies that we're talking about today, but sure, over the course of a career, you will always have those relationships. It's, it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to have the confidence to be receptive. And oftentimes, there's a fragility, and not everybody can handle an honest back and forth. Mm -hmm. That's a good way of putting it. Being confident to, to accept the notes, to, to listen to a different point of view. I think is, is important. My favorite part is that creative collaboration. Uh, least favorite part is in the very, I've been very lucky to not be in this position very often when it seems like, wait, are we gonna, are we making different movies? Usually if you talk it through and realize, no, this is about the movie, mm -hmm. you, get, you get through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I also think there's a, um, a philosophy of uh, making a virtue out of a problem. 
And if you're in sync with your director, yeah. that that's the ultimate sort of um, best part of your relationship. Mm -hmm. There may be stomping around and a bit of a tantrum, but ultimately you think, we're going to make a virtue out of this. Right. Um, and there's been so many instances on um, the last two films that I've made where there's sort of ridiculous things happen out of the blue. It's never the thing you think it's going to be, ever. And suddenly you're faced with this ridiculous problem and they make it better. And they've made, there are two instances, one in The Lobster and, and, and uh, one in The Favourite, where it was a massive improvement having had this terrible problem. You think it's unsolvable and it's going to ruin the entire movie and it's terrible. And in fact, it made the film much better. Um, but you can never anticipate what, it, what that's yeah. going to be. Mm -hmm. Tell me um, the example from The Favourite, because I know you've worked with Yorgos on two films now, and he probably has a very specific vision for things. Well, this is a, this is a tiny, minor one. It's mm -hmm. a bit of a spoiler alert. Tiny, tiny, <laughs> tiny. Um, there was a cockfight that figured quite uh, heavily in the beginning of the film. And you can't do a cockfight. And I had to say no. Uh, we all have to say no. It's not legal. You can't represent it. You can't even fake it. And, and he's into very, you know, authentic. Um, uh, everything has to be authentic. And so this was a, a massive tragedy from which I thought we would never come back. Um, and they went away. He and uh, Tony, the writer, went away and came back and rewrote it as a duck race, which is, <laughs> which is now being kind of, um, you know, oh, it's one of our favorite scenes, great. what a great scene. Great. And, but, it, you know, that would have never happened. And it's funny and it's witty and it's silly, whereas the cockfight would have been very, you know, very aggressive and quite serious. Mm. But um, anyway, that's a minor example. Mm -hmm. There's loads of others, but I'm not getting to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, the industry has changed so much over the past few years. What is required to be a successful producer today that maybe wasn't a requirement, uh, you know, a few years ago? I mean, ben? you have to be aware of a lot more now in terms of, like you say, spoiler alert, you know, it's <laughs> just the social media aspect of operating in your little, you know, womb that you used to when you were making a film was, was really, you had no idea how great that was that you could keep things secret. Now, nothing's a secret, you know, marketing is completely changed, doing a soundtrack's completely changed. I mean, everything is now under a microscope. And so it affects the way you operate. And I think that's a huge difference mm -hmm. about, you know, how you do things from 10 years ago. So I think navigating a slate knowing that to get a movie made and released, um, that every movie needs to have its own uh, sort of intricately plotted path mm. to actually, to get it developed, who cares? It doesn't, it doesn't really matter if you've developed something. It only matters if you've gotten it made. And so with each movie having to decide and anticipate very early on in the process, what is the path that will actually result in this movie being released, being valued by the people who are releasing it, and being seen by hopefully as many people as possible? And to be able to see that so early when there's so much you don't yet know is a huge challenge um, because it's not like studios are lining up to make a giant slate of films that aren't, at this point, many of those films are already decided upon. There are franchises that are. Uh, you know, taking up a good chunk of the schedule. And so what are going to be Don't the Don't look at slides? Kevin McFay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may, might have something to do with somebody at this table. <laughs> I'm not mentioning any names. Yeah, 2023, um, <laughs> July 4th. Like. So there are, so the if you're not one of those, um, finding, is threading the needle so that you still end up mattering and you still end up on a, on the slate with, is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about films that matter, what we've seen with Crazy Rich Asians and Black Panther this year and these diverse uh, casts at the center of films, tell me about, was there a big fight you had to take on to get these two movies made with the cast that they had? Uh, not for us, no. We, we uh, uh, had Black Panther on our schedule for, for a while and we're looking forward <laughs> to, to bringing it to the big screen. And it was a great... Uh, 
uh, we had amazing support. Bob Iger and Alan Horn at no point questioned it, and quite the opposite. You know, said this needs to stand alongside the biggest movies you've made, and it had a budget, you know, that matched that. And at no point was there a question about this market or that market, or where does it play, or what does it not play. It was um, a big movie that we were going to make with an all, almost entirely African and African American cast, and it was nothing but support. Nina, how was your experience with? the strategy to get Crazy Rich Asians made. Well, we made a very specific decision in that case, which was we're not gonna develop it inside the studio system because it will be too easy for somebody to not make it or to have to make a concession that was fundamentally not true to the movie, which could have been even saying, this is a giant movie star in China, and if you put this person in the movie, even though that person might not be right, you'll get your movie made, right? So it wasn't necessarily the assumption that somebody will make the lead of the movie a white girl, right? It was more just knowing that this movie needs to be developed outside of the system. And so, you know, we partnered with Ivanhoe and we developed it, budgeted it, found John Chu. He had an incredible vision for it. Um, we scouted. We were we went to studios and to streaming services with what was a yes or no proposition. So here's our $30 million movie with an all Asian cast. Um, we want it to be green lit. We don't want to have to meet any particular benchmark in terms of cast other than the best person for the role. Obviously, we'll collaborate because that's what a good producer does, but we don't want anything that can get in the way of this movie being made. And we could then say, who wants this the most, believes in it the most, is the best home, and can find the biggest audience for it. So your family is, like, rich? Um, we're comfortable. That is exactly what a super rich person would say. It's not a big deal, obviously. I just think it's kind of weird that I had no idea. I mean, you have a Jamba Juice card. You use my Netflix password. Has anything about the success of these two movies over the past year surprised even you? Or is it what you expected? It's certainly what we hoped for. I think the level of success, uh, certainly domestically but around the world, uh, surpassed even our very high expectations. Um, and it was great mainly uh, for dispelling myths, for dispelling the myth mm -hmm. that uh, yes. that this uh, part of the world doesn't want to see these types of people, are, and just blowing it out of the water. And now, hopefully, certainly, we are going to continue that with with many of our films. Mm -hmm. uh, but the world can follow suit. Mm -hmm. A lot of these films do feel very timely right now. How do you know when it's the right time to make a movie, Paul? Good question. Um, well, feel really, because you've got to be thinking about where you're going to be in a couple of years' time. Um, I mean, speaking for myself, I, I, I tend to make films that are kind of about the world out there. Um, so you try and think about the things that you care about most. I mean, in my case, it was the rise of the far right and where that was leading us. And so that really led, led me to that film, you know. Um, but you have to... I think it's very important, I don't know what you guys think, but I, I think the, the hardest thing is to identify what you care about most. I think if you can identify that and, and sing the song that only you can sing, if that's the right expression, it, you know, that, then it, it shows because the film has an, an inner truth and an inner passion about it. Well, that's about finding a director like yourself or... We were lucky that Ryan Coogler wanted to come on board and had something to say and had questions that he'd struggled with growing up in Oakland, California, and using using this our genre and our canvas to tell it on a in a big way. I also think you know th there could have been a Black Panther movie ten years ago, twenty years ago. It would have been a very different movie. Mm. Um, uh, luckily, Ryan's very young; he would not have <laughs> been directing it ten years, twenty years ago. Uh, but. You know, we find ourselves with these universal characters, the, the iconic characters that have been in comics for 50 years or more. But we tell the story that, you know, what the, the world influences us as we tell these stories. Mm -hmm. And Wakanda in particular was always about uh, uh, sort of the fear of the, the, the uh, sort of the negativity that comes from isolationism. Mm -hmm. This is a mysterious African country that has this amazing technology and well, if that existed, what else? What, why, why have they allowed what was going on in Africa to go on over the past 200 years? 
And that was one of the questions Ryan dealt with, and that's why that movie is has a very globalist message, not unlike 22 July. Um, I think that we were writing that film uh, a number of years ago, so it, it becomes, as often happens, even more relevant somehow by the time it actually is released. Nice. So primitive. It's a vibranium car, you idiots. The bullets won't penetrate. What are you doing? Just drive. I think as producers, though, timing is not always within your control. You know, Absolutely. I mean, if you can kick on your director hat and your writing hat, mm. it, it can be slightly easier to, to, to overcome the financing and casting and other obstacles. And, and, and like Nina was saying, oh, you know, you can make your movie, you put this actor in it, but you know in your heart it's not the right actor for the movie. You know, you're faced with those kind of things all the time. But, you know, there's so many variables. I mean, it's like I, I'm, I'm a little older than rest of you and used to watch the Ed Sullivan show and there was a guy who had like 12 plates Plate spinning. spinning. That's exactly and, 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 and it feels feel. like that all the time. It's like until you get all 12 <laughs> plates spinning, you're, you're not getting a movie made. And timing is not always within your control, but a lot of the time, timing does end up being in your favor. And, you know, even in the case of A Star is Born where Bradley Cooper was offered the role as an actor originally, um, he felt he was actually a little young to do the movie. And when he came back around as the director, he was happy to hire himself as the actor because he was a little older at that point mm -hmm. and felt like he could portray the character better, you know? The favorite had a, had a um, sort of different trajectory. Um, and particularly when you're financing out of Europe, it's, it's a totally different ball game, as you both know. Um, I, it was in development for 20 years. And it, you beat us. <laughs> <laughs> How many did you have? Eleven. <laughs> uh, but it was sort of a, so you can't predict the timing. It's so difficult. I mean, it, it, had I made it 20 years ago or 15, it would have been a completely different film with a totally different reception. But um, the timing can work in your favor. And somebody said to me not long ago, they said, somebody not in the industry, they said, well, were you waiting for Yorgos to be born? <laughs> and, I, and I thought, well, yeah, yeah. maybe, yeah, I was yeah. actually, maybe I was. Yeah. I mean, I can't come up with a better reason. But um, in the end, he made the film that I had always visioned it to be. Mm -hmm. um, so if it had been made 15 years ago, it would have been a completely different film. Mm -hmm. But the timing thing is, a, it's very mutable and it's a hard thing to kind of control. Yeah, and I think like Alfonso also like keeps saying that he had this idea of telling the it's his own stories from his memories, and he he wanted to do it 15 years ago. He started with the idea, but then came sort of gravity that I guess make, gave him the possibility to do it the way he wanted to do it. Gave him the freedom to say, you know, I want to do it this way, which was with no script, with like a really long shoot, with all the all the technology that he uh, that exists now and that he learned in that process uh, uh, on gravity as well that gave him more elements and more freedom mm -hmm. to be able to do the film that he wanted mm -hmm. so like you were saying you know had he had he done it well I wouldn't have done it <laughs> for sure 50 years ago <laughs> not have met him but but it, it gave him the possibility to make the film that he wanted to make so definitely timing and then and there's no there's no exact science to know when's the right time and when it isn't like children of men he had it also before Harry Potter but it came out and then right after you know the whole immigration crisis and it mm -hmm. now it's become so relevant from you know a story that seems like it was set in the future but it seemed predictable, you know, to now where, where Children of Men was then. So, yeah, timing. <laughs> with, with Ben is back, we were actually really hell-bent on having the movie released this year. So it's the fastest that I've ever made a film. We had a sense of real urgency given the subject matter and how profound the crisis is in our country with the prevalence of opiates that are crushing so many lives across the country. You know, we had our wish list for actors, but we felt like 
we're going to hire somebody who can make the movie on that timeline. And it turned out that for Julia Roberts, it was at the very beginning of that timeline. It's one of the first movies where we financed early prep out of our pocket to be able to make the movie on the timeline that we aspired to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was pretty much the same. We, we, the 22 July, we made really, really fast. And there's something thrilling about that. It is. Be- particularly where you're wanting to address what's going on out there, and it's a it's a rising situation. So to make it fast and put it out fast is is it gives it an energy and an inner kind of resilience, which I think is good. You know, mm-hmm. Paul, how heavy does the reaction of the real people uh, weigh on you when you're making these movies that are based on um, real events? A lot, yeah. a lot. I mean, you have to start by asking them. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. their permission. The people who are caught up in these events always feel, in my experience, quite a bit different to what you would think. For the people directly involved, it's an intensely private moment of grief and pain, unimaginably so. Then later you find that the roles reverse, but the tension remains. For those of us not involved, we have to get on with our lives, and our you know, political and religious leaders tell us that we need to, and we tell our children that we need to carry on as normal, and that's important so we don't surrender to these things. But of course, for those directly involved, there's no getting on with it. Their lives are it, it changed forever, and so there's that tension. So when you go and see them, they want, they want to talk about it. They want to talk about what's going on and, mm-hmm. you know, with the rise of the far right because they've seen it. I need to do it. And don't push yourself so hard. Just say a few words, that's all. And say what? What happened? The truth. That I cry in my sleep? I'd rather not go than let him hear that. Then what is it you want? I want to make him see what he's done. I just want to beat him. First time it happened to me, I was working at Warner Brothers, and we wanted to do, to do the Selena movie. And Greg Nava brought Selena's father in to meet us. When you're facing someone's father, and it's very, very sobering, because you're talking about making a movie, which is a business proposition at the end of the day, but you're trying to be so sensitive and you're just all of a sudden in this position with somebody who's suffered this horrible tragedy, but you're talking about how how you're casting a movie, who's gonna play their daughter or their son, you know, it's it's intense. You've done it many, many, many times. And movies are held to a much higher standard, which which is, I suppose, fair enough because it's such a powerful medium. Because they live forever. It's Mm. supposed to be the truth. That's why there's so much controversy. That's when my hat goes off to like directors or creatives who actually put themselves out there into into wanting to face that challenge because like for the rest of us we're just sort of helping you make it but it's you who mm. actually represent and take the chance. I mean Alfonso on this one obviously it's personal it's his mm. own life and that that was a lot of like digging in the in there, but that was all his own choice to do that and sort of show that to the world and decide to open himself up that way. But and did he find uh, it hard? I mean, was he? Was I it a think challenge so. I mean, him? he he made it a challenge for us for mm. sure. So. <laughs> I, yeah, I imagine he must have had very specific things he wanted to tell this story. What was sort of the most demanding thing you had to figure out? Having all the responsibility on me, and yes, he's he's also the producer of the film, but he was directing it and writing it and editing and and DP. photographing yeah. it. So I was like. Okay, something's got to give, right? <laughs> so, Somebody's um, got to get on the phone. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so at the beginning, you know, the fact that we didn't have a script and we did this whole process that was based on his memories and him just telling us what he wanted felt like that was going to be the most difficult thing of all. Once we got into the rhythm of knowing, you know, like every every scout was a tech scout and we needed to bring 30 people in because every department needed to be represented because we all needed to like, oh, what, what's he going to want here? Or if he says like, oh, that kid's going to be wearing a helmet, obviously. And I'm like, oh, only you know that you were wearing a helmet, you know, like 30 years ago. I don't know. But 
there is a psychological and a deep process as well, not only about him like directing and the whole creative that he puts, and he puts his whole life into all his movies, but this one must have had like effects. You know, we were shooting the scene where the father's putting his stuff in a car, and I was just thinking with Eugenio Caballero, our production designer, I was like, this is going to be a day that we all just step away let him do what he needs to do. <laughs> Just have lots of like green tea ready, <laughs> you know, whatever. But, but yeah. So I, I the the personal um, aspect of it and the risk you take telling. I mean, for him, his own personal story. Mm-hmm. But for you mm-hmm. and for everybody that tells like real stories of people is is an amazing challenge or leap of faith, I guess, into mm-hmm. telling a story that's so personal. Was there anything you had to tell him, no, we just can't do oh. it? Oh, of course. I tried to tell him, no, <laughs> we can't do this a lot, but yeah. he always gets his way. <laughs> and I think the only thing that didn't happen was, like, he wanted to film in the places where we the real things happened. And so the neighbors were all excited, and they were like, and remember, there was this, like, bear that used to play a tambourine. And Alfonso goes, like, I want a bear playing a tambourine. <laughs> and Nico Selly is my co-producer. He's like, oh, I love this challenge. I'm going to do it. <laughs> and after, obviously, calling every Sue, every, like, plays around <laughs> someone telling him he's not getting a bear. <laughs> Um, this year we almost had a new category at the Oscars, the popular Oscar. Um, what were your thoughts when this was announced and sort of the uproar that then followed? I thought, oh God, I heard they were doing a popular Oscar. It was some sort of um, like X Factor it's yeah. some sort of mentality. And um, But what's amazing is how they swiveled and swerved so quickly and got out of it. Um, I thought it was a terrible idea, personally. I mean, I mean, popular, I mean, how do you define mm. popular? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then where does it go? Because uh, do you yeah, end exactly. up, do you have an unpopular yeah, category? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, Good point. Come on. But the fact that movie's popular doesn't mean it needs to not be good. I mean, why right. can't two worlds live together, no? Mm. I don't know. Well, well that's what I, we I, thought. I mean, we certainly think that, and, and, and Black Panther came up a lot in, the, in that uproar in those conversations. But a testament to, to, to Disney and to, and to everyone involved, we were just sort of kept talking about best picture. So no one would want a best popular Oscar. No, it, feels pat- it feels patronizing. Yeah, exactly. And, I agree. and exactly. as, and especially this year, that felt like it was a way of ghettoizing mm. movies that succeeded with people of color. To say, well, these films can't be judged just on their own merits, but they were popular. Mm. <laughs> and and also, I think the, the work that you end up making and believing in, it comes from the inside out. You don't mm. think... What will other people like? It should be about your own emotional reaction and not measuring some external notion of what other people will like. It it felt very outside Mm -hmm. in, Mm -hmm. in a medium that I think is best served by inside out, no matter what Mm -hmm. the genre. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, there's nothing more personal than Black Panther. It can be a big, giant movie and still come from a very personal place. It's got to be something you believe in (laughs) and that you feel strongly about, you know, (laughs) and you're you're not like, oh, someday this is going to do $500 million. I'm sure of it. No, it's like, I got to get this thing done. We have to tell this story. When it comes to changing directions, Bill, I know Clint Eastwood and Beyonce were at one time attached to Star is Born. What happened and how did you sort of deal with maybe starting over? You know, time just happened. You know, there was a moment where that was the best version of the movie. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, I mean, Beyonce got pregnant at one point, and then, you know, Clint went off and did another movie. So things, like we were all saying before, it's the plate spinning, you know? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. at the time, you know, I thought, I'm, I'm going to be able to make a movie with my old, dear friend. Not old. My <laughs> young, dear friend. And I was so excited about it. I mean, he read the script, and he said, I'll do it. And I called Beyonce. She came out, and she met with Clint, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, I think I'm watching something historic about to happen, you know? And then... It didn't happen, you know, so it's just it's just the movie business. Mm-hmm. Um, when we're talking about diversity, a big topic of conversation has been the idea of an inclusion writer. 
What is sort of your take on that? Would you want uh, representation in writing in some form when it comes to making movies? Maybe the answer is yes, maybe the answer is no. Um, if you're in a position of power and you're the one doing the hiring, <clears throat> we have learned on our last uh, number of movies uh, and a number of movies that haven't come out yet or haven't been announced yet from, from us, uh, that the more diverse the group of people around the table, the better the movie mm -hmm. and the better yeah, the yeah, ideas mm -hmm. and the better it's going to look. And, and Ryan Coogler asked us, said, um, uh, you know, do you have uh, production designers, costume designers that, that you like to work with? We said, sure. Um, but if you have some, let, let us know. And he said, well, I've worked with, with various people on films that were excellent, but much smaller than Black Panther. And our answer is never outright no, it's let's, let's meet. And in the case of uh, every single crew member uh, that he brought to us, they blew us away. They were, they were incredible. Rachel Morrison ended up uh, being nominated for Academy Award while we were filming or just after we were filming. And there are big sets on Black Panther, big world-creating mm. sets. And our production designer blew us away in the presentation and in the delivery of the, of the movie. Ruth Carter doing our, doing our costumes that were somewhat inspired by the comics, somewhat inspired by an in-house visual development department we have at Marvel, and then brought to life. And that movie couldn't possibly have looked any better mm. with anybody else. And it was because I think we were open to listening and, and, and believing in Ryan, um, but giving people an opportunity. Mm. Uh, and now, you know, we're desperate to work with them all on all of our films going forward. Mm -hmm. But there's a bottleneck problem. You know, there's a, there's a studio issue. There's a business issue. There's a education issue. You know, there's there's not enough opportunities for people coming from different backgrounds to get into the entertainment business, you know? The business needs to mature in the way that it's more inclusive. It's, there's just not enough representation. Whether it should be, you know, an inclusion rider or not, it, it, it's gotta be people looking around and bringing more people under the tent to make television and film, you know? Mm -hmm. But I do think sometimes, People need a push for change to happen. People mm -hmm. need a push and they need pressure yeah. because it's very easy for people to say, I just want to work with the people I know and trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to work with the people who have movies like this on their resume. And with change being so incremental, if Hollywood and the system needs a kick in the pants and a bit of coercion to move the needle, then so be it, because it's time to try to undertake opening doors at a much earlier stage, educating people at a much earlier stage about jobs that exist, creating apprenticeships and mentorships so that it's not just that you have to know somebody in order to get a chance to be a grip or in order to work in the makeup department or any number of roles. And so I think that pressure does have to be applied. And if it's applied in the form of an inclusion writer, so be it. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, for mm -hmm. me, where I come out on it. I mm -hmm. agree. Um, in the sort of Me Too era that we're in, the producers are often responsible for setting the tone on set. A lot of times it's bringing together groups of people who may not have worked together before. How do you all ensure that there are no problems of issues of bullying or harassment on set? Um, um. <laughs> I mean, our crew was, I mean, it wasn't 50-50, but there mm -hmm. were, you know, many, many women on, you know, in, in as heads of department on, at least on A Star is Born. And, and that was really Bradley Cooper's um, lifestyle. You know, he's, he's very close with a lot of, you know, uh, uh, professional women and, and he's worked with a lot of, I mean, we, my producing partner, Lynette, uh, Taylor on the movie, who he did Place Beyond the Pines with, and Karen Murphy and Aaron Benach. And, you know, it was just on and on. Department heads were, were went, our first AD, you know, Shelley Ziegler. And it was just, you know, so if anybody even thought about doing something inappropriate, they, they probably would think twice because they were outnumbered, you know, for the most part. And, um, but I think producers and directors who, you know, uh, care about these things need to make it very clear from the onset. I mean, even just when you're in the office prepping these things, you know, it's just, there's no tolerance for that. And, um, you know, it's a, it, it, it's pretty straightforward it, when it's clear, especially when the filmmaker is, is very vigilant about those things and takes it very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. You well, know, so, it just yeah, permeates the production. Also, it's a yeah. tone of a production, yeah, isn't exactly. it? You, know, you set the tone. It, it, you know, it's either a f inclusive film family and friendly and 
And it's the same thing. If you create that environment where everybody's opinion is important, you get better work is the truth of it. You know? We did Pose, you know, this past year, and we knew that on the one hand, we um, populated the production at every level with as many trans people of color as we could and as many people who had been from the scene and the ballroom scene and knew it well and could help educate everybody about, you know, the the, the realities of, of that time as well as this time. But we also knew that we're going to have people on our crew who probably haven't worked with any trans people before. Mm. And so you you educate and you make sure that you're not afraid to talk about anything in the beginning mm. so that people f feel more confident and more secure about how to be with people who are different than them. And if you're going to keep pushing it forward, there is a component of education and creating a safe space and making sure that everything gets talked about early um, so that people aren't just guessing and not sure exactly um, mm -hmm. yeah. w what's expected of me. But there's also, you can't do it unless you have actual diversity through and inclusion throughout, through and through, right. below the line, above the line, yeah. and, you know, in between the line. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, on this one, we, um, Alfonso hadn't shot in Mexico since Itumuma también, so, and, and he wanted... Um, I don't want to say anti-establishment, but a little bit. He didn't want to necessarily trust that whoever the biggest Mexican gaffer or the biggest Mexican AD is the right person for this job. He wanted to sort of say, who are the young people? Who's new? Who's, who's got, like, send me what you've been doing. Give me some options because I really come with no prejudice here. I'm going to hire who's best for the job. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how many movies you've done before. <laughs> I want this to work. For I mean, it was very unorthodox. We were we worked with non actors. We no script. I mean, so honestly, whatever experience you had, <laughs> maybe you'd have to unlearn it <laughs> and adapt to this new process. So, um, I think that I don't know exactly the ratio of uh, women or men or loads of Mexicans. <laughs> uh, maybe that helps the quota in the U.S. Minorities all the way, but. Uh, but but it, it, it didn't feel that it was necessarily more male-dominated or not. There were loads of young people. I think Alfonso was the oldest person on set. Everybody else was in their 20s or 30s. So, you know, it was an opportunity for people. Some of them were in the second or third movies or some of them first. So in a way, I think that um, we, weren't, we weren't guided by, by any, like, stigma or stereotype of how to crew up. But but I, I asked to specific we, ratio. We shot ours in Norway, which yeah. was interesting because I'd never worked there. And uh, it was the same thing. We just, it was an entirely Norwegian cast and crew, uh, incredibly young, um, you know, diverse and, and just had, it was thrilling actually to, to, to be working with nobody that, you knew, yeah. you know. And that they're super <laughs> eager, right? Or, or knew that you knew. Normally, you know, you kind of, you don't know yeah. them, you know someone who knows yeah. them. It was like literally nobody cast any <laughs> crew. And, you know, setting aside the subject of the film, it made it intensely renewing, yeah. you know, to be there. And and it's always very interesting because it's, it's developing as a big movie location. I think Mission was there mm -hmm. just not so long ago. And... And as an industry, you can see they're evolving mm -hmm. in order to meet, you know, new filmmaking challenges, which was really exciting to watch. So with 22 July and Roma, they're both being released by Netflix, mm. which is obviously more known for its streaming releases. What kind of conversations did you have about having your movie seen on the big screen? In my case, it was pretty straightforward. Um, I sort of finished the screenplay and... Uh, we sort of went out with it on a Monday and I think I spoke to Scott Stuber on the Wednesday and it was a choice really for us. You know, we could have done it at a very small level with the studio or sort of private finance and then distribution. And Scott Stuber got on the phone. He, what he basically said was, we're going to try and create a proper theatrical side to the Netflix offering, you know, alongside the streaming side. We think that's the way the business is going to go. It's not going to be, you know, you make a movie, the studio releases it, then there's a window, then you have a DVD, then you have, you know, and so on. It's going to be this way, and they'll, it'll be different versions. That was essentially his pitch. Uh, then he said, I can't tell you how it's going to go. 
<laughs> you know, but do you want a car? Alfonso is is there. Marty was making his movie. Yeah. Let's see if we can invent this thing. And uh, from my point of view, this particular film, I wanted it watched by young people. Mm. And the challenge that that we faced was young people sadly don't go to see art house movies. They just don't, you know. Um, but of course, they watch them on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so they ended up doing a couple of hundred screens for us. I'm sure they'll be doing something yeah. similar, you know, which is exactly what you would have expected a movie like this to get in the US and Europe. But then we do the stream. I remember talking to my son, who's a college age young man, and he said, well, if you do it art house, my friends will never see it. <laughs> if you put it on Netflix, right. we'll all see it. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, and same for us. Like we, we actually came, like Netflix um, sort of was involved after we were already in the uh, end stages of post-production. And Alfonso felt the same way. You know, this is a movie in Spanish, in black and white, about Mexico City in 1970. It's not like we had all the big studios knocking at our door saying like, we want to distribute it all over the world. And, million theaters like Gravity. So in a way, sort of Netflix was a great platform for having 130 million people having the option to see it. And like Paul was saying, Scott also and Ted sort of are committed to a theatrical release for the film. It'll be selected theaters all, you know, in different places around the world, but it will have that combination of having the, the platform experience and, and the experience of people seeing it online and the theaters for those who love the theater and want to see it in the big screen, mm -hmm. which I'm hoping a lot And what a lot Dis of people Disney will. and Fox are first thing they're going to yeah. do is set up streaming. Yeah. So it, it, the and, whole and Warner Bros. Yeah. yeah, and Warner Bros. You know, and, and Universal. And it's, 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 be it's a great thing yeah. for filmmakers ultimately because there's a lot of movies that, like you were saying before, you know, don't fit into the necessarily the blockbuster. You know, mm -hmm. format and and they should be seen. And it's I think it's great that there's going to be these competitive services and there's going to be a lot more movies for people to see and a lot more movies for people to make and very diverse and interesting. I mean, it's exciting. It's an exciting time. But I don't think it's going to affect the theatrical experience. Do you? I don't, I don't think so. I I, th I hope it doesn't. I mean, I, I go to the movies all the time. My friends go to the movies all the time. I mean. You know, you go to see like, any of the movies mm. that we're talking about here. I mean, they're packed theaters to see them. It's mm. it's an exciting experience. I mean, it is kind of still our you know our uh, you know campfire in many ways. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, you, you know, movies have to have to live up to a higher standard, and and so it's still a very amazing experience. And it's also, you know, I've been going to ma too many uh, you know cinema cons in my life, but mm -hmm. you know, it's still. <laughs> the best bang for your buck when it comes to entertainment. You, know, you mm, can see definitely. something that costs $250 million for $15, you know, you can't, you know, mm -hmm. can't drive a $250 million car for $15. Cece, I did want to ask you with the favorite, you know, it's this very unique take on Queen Anne, I think, that seems to come from Yorgos's uh, mind. What was the biggest challenge? He has a very particular contained uh, view, and he reserves it and conserves it deliberately. He's very intuitive on every level. Casting, yes, even hiring at the department, it's the same process. It's, he, you're not going to talk him into anything. Once you accept that, you have to kind of almost... Um, intuit or inhale what's, what he wants. And we were very fortunate that we had three partners um, speaking the part I hate the most about producing is stitching together the deal <laughs> and the anxiety of closing it. Um, but it's, uh, they, they went with it. They went with his vision. And that was a big leap, really, from the lobster, killing a sacred deer, to this triple, quadruple budget um, of a very perceptive, you know, per, it could be perceived as an oddball take on Queen mm -hmm. Anne. But um, he he got into it, and he's got this very um, amazing, it's almost this alchemy where he is throwing all this stuff at you, and you're thinking, this is insane, and it's it, it's just bizarre. And But it's also very emotional. Somehow he gets under your skin. And at the end of the film, you're kind of going, Damn it, he did. He got under my skin. It was this crazy ride that you go on with him. I'm ready for the Russian ambassador. Who did your makeup? We went for something dramatic. Do you like it? 
You look like a badger. Oh. Are you going to cry? Really? Well, what do you think you look like? Badger. Um, which is incredibly original. Um, uh, but, you know, it was our financiers who backed us, and I, I give them all the credit for, for doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that sounds like I'm sucking up, but <laughs> maybe a little bit. Um, <laughs> maybe just a little it's bit. It's always the next uh, film, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Who are they again? Um, but he... he it's, it, it's his contained vision, which um, you have to get on board with it. You're either on board with it or you're not, because it's not going to work otherwise. I see you nodding your head. It's yeah, a similar I, I thing. Really, you know, he decides, you know, he, decides he, he likes a lot of street casting, which is, I think, very exhilarating. I love doing that. But it really throws the, you know, financiers are going, really? You're going you're gonna to hire that woman who's a, you know, a dinner lady kind of to be the head of the kitchen. And we're going, yeah, doesn't that make sense? I mean, she's it's fun. It is fun because it throws everybody, everybody's game kind of goes, whoops, mm -hmm. what's happening here? You save my wardrobe too. <laughs> right, right out of the kitchen. <laughs> I know, exactly, exactly. But he's, um, you know, you have to get into his headspace. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the way it's done. Mm -hmm. There's no, um, I, I wouldn't call it, Collaborating. It's collaborating on a different level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bill, you're work you worked with first-time director Bradley Cooper. Tell me about how what his directing style is like, especially when directing someone like Lady Gaga, who is not obviously known for acting. I know he says he's a first-time director, mm -hmm. and I can't find any examples of things he directed before this, but he's no first-time director. Mm -hmm. I mean, he showed up. You know, we had to do a test with Lady Gaga because the studio weren't 100% on board when, when we first suggested she would be the lead of the movie. And... Um, so we called in some favors of pe friends of the court, you know, like Janusz Kaminski and others to say, hey, can you come, you know, come to Lady Gaga's house and shoot this test? And Bradley wrote a, a scene with Will Fetters. And, and um, it, it was strange because literally the first shot, you know, Janusz and I are looking at each other going, really, this guy's never done this before, <laughs> you know? So I don't know if he's the best example of how one would work with a first time director, but you know, he spent a lot of time editing and helping produce many of the movies he had been in previously. But, you know, he had a spectacular crew. He had spectacular actors. Um, he had a studio, once we got past the test, who were really 100% behind him. So he, he, he might be a little spoiled because he really <laughs> did get the best of everybody involved in the movie. Um, but I would say he did his homework. And so for a first time director, you know, the one thing you're looking for from your filmmaker is decisiveness. Mm -hmm. And he was extremely decisive about everything. And he knew how he wanted to shoot the movie and he knew how he wanted to shoot Lady Gaga. He knew what he wanted his sound to be like. He knew what he wanted his voice to be. I mean, you gotta remember, he worked for months and months and months lowering his voice, mm -hmm. octaves, learning how to have the certain accent that he had with Tim Monica. I mean, this was months of preparation. Uh, and to look like a guy who had been a rock star for 25 years, you know, a certain kind of diet and a certain kind of physical appearance. So, um, but I would say, and I think everybody would agree, preparation is is mm. the key to it. Even if it's your first time or your 20th time, you know, and and then you get there and when the problems come up or the ideas come up, I mean, you learn a lot of that from David O. Russell. David O. Russell is very spontaneous and he'll see something he wants to do and Bradley does impressions of, of, of David saying, no, no, over here, get the camera, we got it, we're going over here, and you know, there's a lighting, it's okay, okay, you know, that type of spontaneous filmmaking, which is, which is you know, fun to see happen, especially when it works out. But um, he, was, he was ready to go and I guess in his case, you know, one of the things that prepared him so well was having been in the editing room a lot. And so he knew about choices and he knew what he was going to need as he was shooting. And I mean, to watch a guy, you know, 40 years old, who's 
literally moving the cameras around while he's acting over here and, you know, telling the lie. It was pretty amazing to watch. He's an extraordinary individual and, and is a, a brilliant filmmaker as well. Mm-hmm. Paul, you mentioned in passing the Disney-Fox merger, which mm-hmm. I think is just the most recent example of sort of the narrowing of the studio world. Um, Kevin, I'm curious to hear what you think of this merger and if it's going to affect Marvel in any way in the immediate future. Uh, well, it's not 100% complete yet, so there's only so much. Uh, I'm allowed to say there's so much they even tell me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but but uh, Paul mentioned the streaming service, and I think that is something that that we're going to be adding content to, which is exciting. Which I love your uh, analogy of the campfire, right? As many people as you can get around the campfire and tell stories. Campfires can be different. We are going to tell stories for the streaming service that we wouldn't be able to tell in a theatrical experience, uh, a longer form narrative, which we're excited to to dive into. That's what comics are. It's about as long form a narrative as exists. Um, but also maintaining that theatrical experience, Mm -hmm. which of course is our bread and butter. And the lines around the block, if you're lucky, and the theater's full of people as people are enjoying A Star is Born right now. That is a theatrical experience, that's a concert. Mm -hmm. And that's why people keep going back and back. And that's what we want with all of our movies, and certainly Panther provided that. And you have anticipation, and and certainly, um, you know, uh, Black Panther's not real. He's not a real person, but what? he represents, <laughs> he represents <laughs> real hopes and real dreams and real representation. And, and so there's a certain amount of pressure uh, that came with that, delivering on what people have been dreaming about for years, whether they read the comic book or not. Because a lot of people said, wait a minute, this is a hero that looks like me. And the importance of that really can't be understated. Mm-hmm. Having somebody, mm-hmm, um, sure. as we had a film called Ant Man and the Wasp with Evangeline Lilly, um, starring alongside Paul Rudd as the title hero, Brie Larson is starring as Captain Marvel uh, in March for us. And people get so excited to see themselves on that big screen. Um, and, and you take that very, very seriously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, guys, we're going to wrap it up with a few sort of lightning round questions. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start with, uh, what is the best backhanded compliment you've ever received about one of your films? We have a joke at Marvel Studios that, uh, you know, oftentimes we, we try to do a lot in a movie and you, we screen all of our movies in the testing process. Uh, we could probably spend another hour talking about it. Uh, I find it extremely helpful. Um, and we always learn something, usually learn something you're not expecting, which is the value of it. But when people see early cuts of our film, they come up and they go, that's a lot of movie. <laughs> That's a lot of movie. Okay. It's a brave film. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> That's the worst because yeah. it's That's a, a code word yeah. for this stupid, <laughs> um, foolhardy, <laughs> poorly chosen, um, unlikely to succeed in the marketplace. Now, I will say, I, you know, the movie I got that uh, many people, that as an executive, uh, that was the Life Aquatic, and I loved that movie. I loved that movie so much, and I started to be concerned when many people commended it for being brave. <laughs> um, but I still really love it. I still really love the film, Good but you. it did not make money. So uh, brave is the word. I think uh, it scares you. Huh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Great work. I don't know. I my yeah. my brother said to me, um, and it was a couple years after the lobster came out. I got this email from him out of the blue. He said, "As a viewer, did you actually like that movie?" <laughs> and, uh, I mean, he he couldn't help himself. I mean, he had to, he, it had been bothering him for years, you know, because clearly he didn't. Uh, <laughs> That's a good one. Um, what is the craziest thing you've done for a film or for a director? I, I can answer that one. Yeah. I, I didn't actually do it, but I was on Bloody Sunday. Uh, but it's a producer's story. Mm-hmm. I was working with a producer who was a dear friend of mine called Mark Redhead. And we were standing in the pouring rain one day, and we, it was a film with absolutely no money, and we predicated everything on the day with the, where we had the soldiers and the crowd and everything. And uh, there was something in the middle of the set that was anachronistic you know, not 1972, and we had no money, and uh, I think it was like a gas thing or something. And uh, I said, oh, Lord, what are we going to do? Mark said, it's okay, there's some bricks next to it, I'll mix up cement and I'll build a wall, which is what he did. <laughs> and so if you look at that film, he's credited as a producer, but he's also credited as bricklaying <laughs> Marco Testarossa. Nice. <laughs> 
Wow. Gabriella? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I have, there's so many. I'm, I'm trying to think now of what would be one. I, there's just, there's a lot. With Alfonso, there's always hidden challenges everywhere mm -hmm. that now they feel normal to me. I, <laughs> no, I don't have any point of comparison. <laughs> See, I don't know how the other directors treat their producers. Yeah. So yeah. to me, like, this is what I needed to do. It's expected of me. Yeah, we I couldn't to, point we, out one. I we had to get a pregnant pig down yeah. a hill. With a lobster, and um, that was quite a horrifying experience. The noise was just awful. No, no, it was just awful. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we were in Cape Town. We had to take an ad for a newborn. Like, we literally oh. needed a newborn the day it was born to come over and do it. And, of course, got picked up in the deadline here and everything. We realized if we were, no, we're like, no, 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 we're going to do it all up like, and up. Like and, human trafficking. Or yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, last question here. How would you describe what you do to a kid? Oh. I'm going to that, make everyone answer this one. Well, one. you know, my daughter, Emma, when she was about four or five, turned to me and said, um, I know what the director does, Dad. And I said, what, Emma? She said, they whisper in the actor's ear <laughs> what they're supposed to be doing. And I thought, thank you for explaining the movie business to me at five years old. Now I understand what it is. You know, I think they understand better than we do what the movie business is because it's, it's, it's magic to them, you know, and they, mm -hmm. it's like technology. There's no barrier between, mm -hmm. between kids and the storytelling and the storytelling because they, they, they understand it because they, they, they tell stories all day, you know, and... Um, but I guess I would say that, like, I I'm trying to tell good stories. That's what I do for a living. Story whisperer. <laughs> I'm not, but yeah, I'm, I'm a story figuring it outer. <laughs> He's a whisperer, yeah. 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 How would you guys describe it? Being a producer. I, don't, I don't know. I try to my nieces and my nephews to sort of explain a little bit what I do, and I kind of boil it down to coordinating, and I try to Go relevant to if you're at home and like this is what your mom does every day like she juggles of getting you to school and then making your food and then going to work and then sort of and that's what you do to make so that your that's day good. is perfect and that's kind of what I tell them and so this is what I do but to make that movie and mm. it's like that every single day and some days your brother gets sick some days you're late for school and <laughs> those things are just like overcoming and that's kind of what I try to give them in, some day so you have, have to be extras in the movie <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think that's smart my kids are I have a five year old son and nine year old daughter and they have just started to ask what, what I do mm. and you see they get excited do you Draw the costumes? No. <laughs> oh, you write the story? No. <laughs> oh, you can make the sets? No. <laughs> so they don't quite. It's, but you it's know Black Panther. Right? Right. That's yeah, got to right. be good for <laughs> something <laughs> at the uh, open yes. house at school. Yes. Yeah. I said, you sort of do, a producer sort of does everything and nothing all at the, exactly. all the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, you two. Shall I go first? Yes. Um, well, I would say two things. David, the great David Lean, said that going to the movies as a child, he was talking about as a child, was like as if you were a pious boy in a cathedral looking at the light coming through the stained glass. Uh, and I think if you're a producer, you're making sure that light shines in exactly the right place mm -hmm. and trying to get those young people to have that feeling of awe and wonder that, that I certainly had as a kid, I'm sure we all did, you know, and the producer is the person who sees it all, has to, you know, while the director's there, you know, worrying about everything, the producer's sitting back, you've got to get that light shining just in the, I'm not talking about the light as in on set, I'm talking about the entire sure. experience That's great. has mm -hmm. got to capture the young person's imagination as we were captured. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Um, I guess I would say I look for stories that I love and then find people who are more talented than I am <laughs> uh, to tell those stories in their various capacities and then do everything I can to help them do their best um, and hoping that they'll feel like that that was the best work that they had ever done based on the opportunities and the environment that was created. Mm -hmm. All right, Cece. 
Take us home. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, no, no. Um, I don't know what I would say to a child. Um, <laughs> that I, you know, I'm in a constant state of optimism and pessimism. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because that's, you know, this sort of spiraling state of optimism and pe pessimism at the same mm -hmm. time. And hopefully something, some sort of weird, I know I've used the word before, alchemy comes out of it. There's some kind of magic that the director sort of um, conjures up that um, amuses people, enlightens people, entertains people, um, maybe tells them something uh, they didn't know or make them feel something they haven't felt in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that sounds a bit all very altruistic. but um, <laughs> It's true, though. It's true. true. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Hi, I'm Paul Greengrass. Gabriela Rodriguez. Cece Dempsey. I'm Nina Jacobson. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Thank you for watching The Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter's Roundtable. On YouTube. On YouTube.